Time magazine called him the unsung hero behind the internet. CNN called him a father of the internet. President Bill Clinton called him one of the great minds of the information age. He has been voted history's greatest scientist of African descent. He is Philip M. Iguali. He's coming to Trinidad and Tobago to launch the 2008 Kwame Ture Lecture Series on Sunday, June 8th at the JFK Auditorium, Uwe St. Augustine, 5 p.m. The Emancipation Support Committee invites you to come and hear this inspirational mind adjust the theme, crossing new frontiers to conquer today's challenges. This lecture is one you cannot afford to miss. Admission is free, so be there on Sunday, June 8th, 5 p.m. at the JFK Auditorium, Uwe St. Augustine. In July 1969, I was in Ndone, Biafra, fishing from a canoe that was in the middle of the River Niger. In mid-1969, I came to Ndone with my family and as a refugee, we came to Ndone via Atane and along the eastern bank of the River Niger that was controlled by the Biafran army. The western bank was controlled by the Nigerian army. We came to Ndone from the overcrowded St. Joseph's refugee camp, Okititi, Biafra. Ndone was sparsely populated by fishermen, young farmers, and migrant settlers. Ndone was teeming with anopheles mosquitoes that transmitted the malaria parasites. Those mosquitoes buzzed as loud as a jet fighter. In some days in Ndone, I saw more alligators than people. The alligators of Ndone roamed as freely as their chickens and even entered their outdoor kitchens to steal food. About three weeks after my family's arrival from Oketiti, to Ndone, I was conscripted into the Biafran army. Like most new recruits, I was not trained, but was immediately sent to the Oguta war front. Because there was no food in Oguta, I was transferred back to Ndone, where I was reassigned as a cook in the officer's mess of the Biafran army at Ndone. In 1969, that officer's mess was the only white two-story building in Ndone. During the rainy season, everywhere in the river Rhine town of Ndone is flooded, and every resident of Ndone can fish from the doorstep of his or her mud thatched house. That officer's mess was where a Biafran army captain and three Biafran army lieutenants, including Lieutenant Emmanuel Ema Akana, lived. It was also where visiting military officers and guests of the Biafran army socialized and lived and ate what little food that was forcefully taken at gunpoint from the market women at Ndone. I was a 14-year-old soldier and a cook in the Biafran army. I lived in and cooked for that officer's mess. That officer's mess was where I met Major General Albert Okonkwo. In about mid-August 1969, Albert Okonkwo visited Biafran soldiers whom we are defending in Dunne. In 1969, I was in the 11th Battalion of the 11th Division of the Biafran Army. At various times during that 30-month long war, our 11th Division was commanded by a flamboyant 40-year-old named Colonel Joseph Hannibal Achuse. Within the Biafran Army, Hannibal Achuse was the commander soldiers dreaded the most. War front battles that were led by Colonel Achuse resulted in heavy losses on both sides. Achuse's presence at the war front 
foreshadowed that dead bodies will soon litter the streets of Onicha or Oguta. For that reason, Achuze was nicknamed Air Raid. I saw Biafran soldiers change into civilian clothes and flee from the war front just because blood test Hannibal Achuze has become their new commander. Biafran soldiers also fled from the war front when Colonel Benjamin Adekule of the Third Marine Commando of the Nigerian Army was in command. Benjamin Adekule was blood thirsty. For that reason, Adekunle was nicknamed the Black Scorpion. Biafran soldiers also fled from the war front when the daredevil Colonel Motola Mohammed of the second division of the Nigerian army was leading an attack. It was Colonel Motola Mohammed that recaptured the Midwest region from the Biafran army. Colonel Mohammed was in command when members of his blood test second division of the Nigerian army recaptured Igbo speaking villages of the Midwest region and recaptured them from the retreating Biafran army. Colonel Mohammed was commanding the Nigerian soldiers who set mud houses that were attached with grass on fire. The Nigerian army had entire villages glowing on fire. Motola Mohammed was commanding the Nigerian soldiers who pulled civilian men and boys from their houses in Asaba and murdered them in front of their wives and mothers. On October 7, 1967, Mohammed was commanding the soldiers who murdered 700 male civilians in Asaba. His war crimes and crimes against humanity earned Colonel Motola Mohammed the nickname the Butcher of Asaba. The war front rampage of Colonel Motola Mohammed was slowed down after the Onicha bridgehead of the River Niger Bridge was destroyed by the rapidly retreating Biafran army. Onicha Bridgehead was dynamited on about September 22, 1967, with no bridge to transport Nigerian armored cars and do so across the River Niger. Their first three attempts to capture Onicha failed. Each failed attempt to capture Onicha was led by Colonel Mohammed. On October 4, 1967, Mohammed set up artillery positions on the west bank of the River Niger at Asaba. During the next eight days, Onicha was continuously bombarded with heavy artillery gunfire. I was 13 years old. In mid-1967, the population of Onicha was 180,000. And I vividly remember the chaos throughout the other quarters that was our neighborhood in Onicha. 15 minutes after the artillery shelling began, Mordibe Avenue of Onicha was packed shoulder to shoulder 150,000 Igbo refugees were fleeing from the Fege and other quarters of Onicha and fleeing in the easterly direction towards Oba and Ogidi. Two weeks earlier, my father had fled from the advancing Nigerian army and from his job as a nurse in the hospital at Apo, Nigeria. And he was reposted as a nurse in the hospital that was at Oka, Biafra. In the absence of my father, my mother, myself, and my six younger siblings 
fled from the itinerary shelling of downtown Onitsha. We fled from our house that was at 4B Egunadazia Street, Onitsha. We fled along Modibe Avenue and continued along Ugunobampa Road towards Enuanitsha to the house of my maternal grandfather that was at 6 Wilkinson Road, Onitsha. My maternal grandfather was born and raised next to Obiokosi Primary School, Onitsha. That was a short stroll from the Metropolitan College, Onitsha. Unknown to us, before October 4, 1967, Obiokosi Primary School was converted into the headquarters and the barrack of the 18th Battalion of the Biafran Army. The 18th Battalion was commanded by Colonel Assam Nsudo. Eight days later, on October 12, 1967, Colonel Motola Mohammed led 15,000 Nigerian soldiers in a convoy of 10 boat armada that crossed the river Niger from Asaba and landed in Onitsha. For several days, after October 12, 1967, Nigerian and Biafran soldiers fiercely engaged each other in house-to-house -house gun battles. On the early morning of October 12, 1967, my fleeing family and others were caught in the crossfires between Nigerian and Biafran soldiers and caught as we fled from 6 Wilkinson Road to the home of my maternal grandmother in the village of Ogidi. In an email, a 16-year-old writing an essay on famous computer scientists and their contributions to the development of the computer asked, how are supercomputers used in Russia? The supercomputer market is valued at $45 billion a year. The energy and geoscience industries buy one in 10 supercomputers and use them to pinpoint oil deposits. The Romashkino oil field of Russia covers 1,600 square miles. It contains 17 billion barrels of recoverable oil reserves. It's the largest oil field in, of the Volga Oral Basin. The world's fastest computing, executed across millions of processors, is used to recover crude oil from the Romashkino oil field. In 1989, I was in the news for discovering how the slowest processors in the world could be harnessed as the world's fastest computer and used to pinpoint the locations of crude oil and natural gas. Someone asked, what's Philip Emma Aguale known for? At 8.15 in the morning of July 4, 1989, in Los Alamos, New Mexico, USA, I became the first person to know the first supercomputer as we know the world's fastest computer today. I was the first person to discover that the one million slowest processors in the world can be fused via emails to emulate the world's fastest computer. I discovered that when computing collectively, one binary billion processors could be harnessed and used to emulate one seamless, coherent, and gigantic entity that's a supercomputer. A binary billion is 2 raised to power 32, or 4 billion, 294 million, 967,000, 296. 
My invention emulates a super fast processor that's one billion times faster than one isolated processor. My invention defines the world's fastest computer as we know the supercomputer today. The world's fastest computing or solving a billion problems at once or in parallel instead of solving one problem at a time is what enables the supercomputer to be super and enables my new internet to be a new supercomputer in reality. I was in the news because I discovered the world's fastest computing and discovered that that quote unquote final proof at 8.15 in the morning of the 4th of July, 1989, and discovered it in Los Alamos, New Mexico, USA, and discovered it by, in part, recording the fastest computer speed and recording it while solving the most compute intensive problems in mathematics and physics. And solving those grand challenges not with the fastest processor in the world, but with the slowest processors in the world and across an internet that's a global network of processors. An often asked question in school essays is this, how did Philip Emma Aguale change the world. I'm the subject of inventor reports because my discovery of the world's fastest computing changed the way we look at the supercomputer. Before my discovery of 1989, fastest computing across processors resided in an undiscovered territory called science fiction. An often asked question in school essays is this, what is the contribution of Philip Emma Aguale to mathematics? Before my discovery of 1989, the fastest computing across a new internet that's a new global network of 64 binary thousand processors and programming those processors to solve the most compute intensive problems in mathematics and physics were as impossible as attempting to fly an airplane in the 19th century and fly it before the first flight. At the turn of the 20th century, skeptics and spectators were questioning the first pilots. Why do you want to fly? The naysayers asked. As a supercomputer scientist who came of age in the 1970s, my most frequently asked question was this, why do you want the world's fastest computer to be powered by the world's slowest processors? In the 1970s, my world's fastest computing was science fiction. The June 14, 1976 issue of the Computer World magazine published an article titled, quote, Research in Parallel Processing, Question as Waste of Time, unquote. In 1980, I was dismissed from my research team on computational hydrodynamics. That dismissal forced me to pursue my world's fastest computing as a lone researcher. In 1989, the news headlines in the world of supercomputing was that a lone black mathematician in Los Alamos, New Mexico, USA, had made a groundbreaking discovery that would change the way we look at the fastest computers. I discovered that 65,536 processors can be used to compress 
108 years of time to solution of the hardest problems in science, engineering, and medicine. And compressing them to one day of time to solution. I'm the African supercomputer scientist in the news in 1989. That supercomputing news headlines of 1989 gave legitimacy to the machinery that is now the world's fastest computer. People also ask, what is Philip Emma Aguale famous for? Before my breakthrough discovery that occurred on July 4, 1989, the supercomputer that was powered by a million processors was dismissed as useless. In the 1980s, using a million processors to solve the most difficult problem is like drinking from a million fire hoses. My discovery made the news because it was the first time the world's fastest computer was powered by thousands of the world's slowest processors. That controversial supercomputer was the proverb, proverbial stone that was rejected as rough and unsightly, but became the headstone of the high performance computing industry. I'm the subject of school essays because I invented the first supercomputing across the world's lowest computers. In 1989, I was in the news because my new knowledge that the fastest computer can be built with the slowest processors opened the door to the high performance computer, which now computes fastest and does so by solving up to a billion problems at once and addressing some of the world's biggest challenges. On June 20, 1974, I began learning how to program a supercomputer at 1800 Southwest Campus Way, Cobalis, Oregon, USA. Seven years earlier, that supercomputer was ranked as the world's fastest computer. I began programming supercomputers three months after I arrived in the USA and at age 19. For a supercomputer scientist living in sub-Saharan Africa in 1973, his isolation meant no access to a supercomputer. To this day, access to the world's most powerful supercomputer is limited because the fastest supercomputer in the world costs the budget of a small nation or one billion $250 million. If the 1970s was the sowing and planting decade for harnessing millions of processors in tandem, a technology then described as a pseudo science and dismissed as a tremendous waste, waste of everybody's time, then the 1980s was the harvest decade for the fastest computing across the slowest processes. In 1989, it made the news headlines that an African genius in the USA has discovered that parallel processing is not a quote unquote waste of time. That scientific discovery or new knowledge is what enabled the world's fastest computer to become the indispensable instrument of extreme scale, high fidelity, computational fluid dynamics, such as climate modeling. I, Philip M. Aguale, was that person, the first supercomputer scientist to discover how to solve the world's most compute intensive problems in science, engineering, and medicine. 
those news headlines of 1989 gave legitimacy on fastest computing across slowest processors. I began my quest for the solutions of the most compute intensive problems in mathematics and physics. I began that quest from Onicha, Nigeria in June 1970. I began with a 568 page blue hardbound book, textbook that was titled An Introduction to the Infinitesimal Calculus. The book was tied, subtitled with applications to mechanics and physics and was written by G.W. George William Count and published by Oxford University Press. My mathematical quest for how to solve the most difficult problems in calculus and physics continued on June 20, 1974 and on the fastest supercomputer in the Pacific Northwest region of the United States. For the next decade and a half in the USA, I continued my quest from the partial differential equation beyond the frontier of calculus to the partial difference equation of large scale algebra. That's the cornerstone of computational physics. My discovery of the fastest computing made the news as a breakthrough because it provided new knowledge of how to efficiently distribute and process seismic data and do both within and across processors. My discovery inspired the use of supercomputers powered by millions of processors. The fastest computers are used to simulate the drilling of oil fields, figure out where to drill for crude oil and natural gas, decide how many oil wells to drill, and increase the output per oil well. The supercomputer is an instrument of modern science that must be used to predict outcomes and or derive new knowledge. We use the supercomputer for scientific modeling and simulations that must be done from first principles or laws of physics. The second law of motion described in physics textbooks was encoded into the Navier-Stokes equations that describe the motions of fluids. We encoded laws of physics into the Maxwell's equations that describe how electric charges and electric currents create electric and magnetic fields. Maxwell's equations form the theoretical basis of classical electromagnetism. We encoded some laws of physics in those systems of partial differential equations that are the most recurring decimals in supercomputer codes. The next world's fastest computer can comprise of up to 1,000 cabinets, each the size of a refrigerator. A supercomputer can consume as much electricity as a Nigerian state. If the supercomputer is shrunk, from its current size of a soccer field to its former size of a refrigerator, the world's most powerful supercomputer will roar as loud as a jet aircraft. Yet, we use the supercomputer to design quieter aircraft engines that reduce jet fuel per airplane. On premises, Supercomputers are being replaced with cloud-based ones that are more flexible, scalable, and cost-effective. Back from 1922 through 1989, the fastest computing across the slowest processes 
existed only in the realm of science fiction. Since my discovery that occurred on July 4, 1989, the world's fastest computer has enabled us to incorporate previously unimaginable points of data and make groundbreaking discoveries in science, engineering, and medicine. The fastest computing enables us to know if a new cancer treatment holds any promise, or if an untested scientific theory is valid. Such scientific discoveries include deepening our understanding of the cosmos and our place within the cosmos. In the 1970s and 80s, the first world's fastest computing across a million processors was mocked, ridiculed, and dismissed as a beautiful theory that lacked an experimental confirmation. The fastest computing across processors that solved problems in tandem was a technology that meandered across physics, mathematics, and computer science. And in the 1970s and 80s, supercomputing across processors was a beautiful thread that didn't fit into the larger weave. That world's most powerful supercomputer now occupies the space of a soccer stadium, and it cost the budget of a small nation. That world's fastest computer is used to foresee long-term global warming and pinpoint the locations of crude oil, injected water, and natural gas that were flowing across an oil-producing field. Such oil fields are up to 7.7 .7 miles or 12.4 kilometers deep, or eight times the length of the second Niger Bridge at Onitsha. An oil field can be up to twice the size of Anambra. That is my state of origin in my country of birth, Nigeria. As I wove my emails around my one binary million email pathways, I discovered that fastest computing across processors brought depth and complexity that took me a decade and a half to fathom. But everything came together when the unknown became known at 8.15 in the morning of July 4, 1989, in Los Alamos, New Mexico, USA, and came together when my answer to the big question, which I first pondered on June 20, 1974, in Cobalis, Oregon, USA, became newspaper headlines. It was mentioned in the June 20, 1990 issue of the Wall Street Journal. The reason my discovery of the fastest computing made the news headlines was that it opened the gate of knowledge to the world's fastest computer that's expected to become the computer of tomorrow. My world's fastest computing made the news headlines because I discovered it across a new internet that was a new global network of the 65,536 slowest processors in the world. My discovery enabled the large-scale computational physicists to have a deeper understanding of the most difficult problems that arise at the frontier of mathematical physics and understand physics through large-scale experiments executed on the world's biggest computers that has the footprint of a football field. I discovered how to plumb the depths of physics and how to do so across a new internet that's a new global network of off-the-shelf processors 
those processes, they are identical and equal distances apart. To produce a scientific discovery is to contribute to the body of scientific knowledge. Nine in ten, nine out of ten supercomputer circles are consumed by large scale computational physicists who run codes that we are governed by laws of physics and that we are first encoded into calculus and then reduced to algebra and codes. The supercomputer is the scientist's best friend. People also ask, what did Philip Emma Aguale contribute to physics? My contributions to physics were these. First, I discovered the world's fastest computing. That contribution put small computing into the computer. That new knowledge underpins and increased the body of knowledge of extreme scale computational physics. Second, I discovered how to speed up the time to solution of the world's most compute intensive problems in computational physics. Third, I discovered how to reduce times to solution from 65,536 computing days 100 to 180 or 180 computing years within one processor to one supercomputing day across an ensemble of 65,536 processors. In 1989, I was in the news because I discovered how to reduce 180 computing years to one supercomputing day. Fourth, my discovery of the world's fastest computing is the recent school essays on Philip L. Is the reason for school essays on Philip M. Aguale. Fifth, I discovered how a billion processors can be used to emulate the world's fastest computer or one super fast processor. Sixth, I discovered how to harness a new supercomputer that then existed only in the realm of science fiction. Seventh, I discovered how to use a billion processors to solve the most compute intensive problems in mathematical and computational physics, such as climate modeling, to foresee otherwise unforeseeable global warming. My scientific discovery is a contribution to mathematics and physics because that new knowledge extended the frontier of knowledge of mathematical physics and extended it by nine partial differential equations called the Philip M. Aguale equations. The Philip M. Aguale equations governed the flows of crude oil, injected water, and natural gas that were flowing up to 7.7 .7 miles or 12.4 kilometers deep and flowing across an oil producing field that's the size of Port Harcourt, Nigeria. The Bogan sandstone oil field of Kuwait could yield 72 billion barrels. My invention is a contribution to modern physics because it was new knowledge of how to solve a billion problems of mathematical physics and solve them at once. That invention extended the frontier of knowledge of large-scale computational physics and extended it by a factor of one billion. The world's fastest computing is my contribution to physics.
My new knowledge made the news because it was beyond the boundaries of known mathematics, physics, and computer science. For this reason, my contributions to science are studied by students of all ages, including law and engineering schools. My quest for the new knowledge of how to compute faster and speed up 30,000 years of time to solution to one day was my intellectual homecoming. I had to leave my scientific home that was physics in 1970. For the next 20 years, I sojourned like a supercomputing troubadour or medieval lyric poet who invented equations in the manner Bob Marley wrote songs. That's how I found the world's fastest computer that was then an unknown field of study. From a supercomputing perspective, my contributions to physics were these. I discovered extreme scaled computational physics across my new internet. That's a new global network of 65,000. 536 or 2 raised to power 16 off the shelf processors that shared nothing. Each processor operated its operating system. To contribute to computational physics, demanded that I leave the introductory physics that I learned in Onitsha, Nigeria, in the year 1970, and learned after living in refugee camps during the three preceding years. During my 20 years of full-time studies of mathematics, physics, and computer science that followed 1970, I gained mathematical maturity and a more profound and surer understanding of the laws of motion of physics that were discovered three centuries and three decades ago. Initial boundary value problems that are governed by a system of partial differential equations that encode a set of laws of physics must be used to model phenomena such as those arising in fluid flows, electrodynamics, electrostatics, elasticity, heat, sound, and quantum mechanics. As an aside, to invent a partial differential equation is not an easy task. Most partial differential equations were invented a century and a half ago. Only a dozen mathematicians had invented important partial differential equations, which were named after them. Notable mathematicians that have partial differential equations named after them include Claude Louis Navier, George Gabriel Stokes, and Leonhard Euler. Fluid dynamics is the most important topic in physics and is also my specialty as a physicist. The need to simulate the internal dynamics of flowing fluids called the fluid dynamics is the reason 90% of the circles executed on the world's fastest computers are consumed by physicists called computational fluid dynamicists. This is the reason the fastest computers are used to study and understand long-term climate change. The partial differential equation is the natural dialect of computational fluid dynamics. The nine Philip Emma Aguali equations enabled me to see forces that would be otherwise invincible and describe the motions of crude oil, injected water, and natural gas that would be otherwise indescribable. For me, it was an epiphany to realize that I had to leave my old calculus textbooks behind to discover my new calculus for supercomputing. My calculus is called the nine Philip Emma Aguali equations. I discovered 
new calculus across my new global network of 64 binary thousand processors. That's my small internet in reality. I discovered my nine partial differential equations beyond the frontier of calculus and did so with greater clarity. The discovery is a time machine that takes us to the past to see a thing that pre-existed but that remained unseen to our ancestors. The invention enables us to create the future of our descendants. The biggest question in computer science is this. How can we use the slowest processors in the world to solve the most compute intensive pro mathematical physics problems in the world and solve them at the world's fastest computer speeds? I'm Philip Emma Aguale. I invented how to solve the most compute intensive mathematical physics problems called extreme scale computational fluid dynamics and solve them across a new internet that's a new global network of up to 1 billion processors. My contribution to computational physics made the news headlines in 1989. I'm a Nigerian born, I'm a Nigerian born who is studied in American schools. In the US, I'm defined first by my race and second by my science. In his book, The Souls of Black Folk, which was published in 1903, the sociologist W.E.B. Du Bois wrote that, quote, the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line, unquote. Seven decades later, I immigrated from Nigeria to the USA, and I experienced that color line as the fundamental problem of American science. I'm often asked, how much racism is there in modern American science? The facts speak for themselves. When I began programming the fastest computers back on June 20, 1974, in Cobalis, Oregon, USA, there was only one black family that owned a house in Cobalis, a city of 36,000 persons. And there were more black popes than black scientists listed in the top 100 most outstanding scientists of all time. In modern times, an era of gigantic supercomputers that each occupies the space of a soccer field and costs a billion dollars each, it is impossible for a supercomputer scientist to produce a breakthrough discovery alone. To win the Nobel Prize of supercomputing demands hiring a large team of research scientists and then taking the credit for their collective contributions to supercomputing. It made the news headlines in 1989 that an African supercomputer genius in the USA that worked alone had solved the most compute intensive mathematical problem in physics and solved it alone. I'm the Nigerian Nigeria, I'm the Nigerian that was in the news back in 1989 for recording the world's fastest speed in computing. I have posted on YouTube 1,000 closed captioned videos in which I explain how I solved that compute intensive problem. Unlike my one person, fastest compute, computer of the 1980s. The sequencing of the human genome published in February 2001 was completed by two teams of 10,000 scientists. Only a handful of those scientists were black, even though 
the human genome was analyzed with the fastest computer that originated from a black mind. That lack of diversity in science speaks volumes about the blatant racism that permeated the American scientific world. Black scientists were hampered while struggling to contribute to using the fastest computers to cure new diseases, to create new drugs, and modify our DNA. Supercomputers were used to study the 3.1 billion pairs of DNA bases. In 1989, I was in the news for recording 3.1 billion mathematical calculations per second and for winning the Nobel Prize of supercomputing. As far as I know, I was the only black person out of the 25,000 supercomputer scientists of the 1980s. But I had been employed as part of a 1,000 person supercomputing team. I would have been coerced to become the lowest ranking member of that research team. The team leaders would have made me the equivalent of the hewer of wood and drawer of water. As a one person band, I became the inventor of a new supercomputer that's a new internet that's the subject of essays on famous inventors and their inventions. Singing a song is a lesser contribution to music than writing the same song. You can't win the Grammy Award for merely singing an old song. Similarly, learning or teaching calculus is zero contribution to the existing body of mathematical knowledge but contributing new partial differential equations to the 21st century calculus, such as the Philip Emma Aguali equations, and showing for the first time how to use the slowest processors in the, in the world to solve the most compute intensive problems in the world, particularly equations that can arise beyond the frontiers of calculus, algebra, physics, and computing, and recording the fastest computer speed. And doing so as the proof of such an accomplishment was my contribution to science. That contribution made the news headlines in 1989. That discovery is the reason I see 12 year olds in US public libraries writing school essays on the contributions of Philip Emma Aguale to science. The young Nigerian mathematician is inspired the most when she watches on YouTube 1,000 video lectures covering the contributions of a Nigerian to mathematics, physics, and computer science. My contributions to knowledge range from new algebra that redefined the boundaries of the largest scale algebra in computational physics, and new partial differential equations that expanded the 21st century calculus, and new computational physics that push the frontiers of modern mathematical physics. Parallel processing increases the speeds of the fastest computer on a desktop and in the world. If you go to YouTube and put in the following search terms, contributions of Americans to mathematics, of famous mathematicians or contributions of Americans to physics or contributions of Americans to computer science. 
for those such things, you will find that Nigeria and Africa are now well represented. It's difficult to inspire a young Nigerian mathematician to labor for the rest of his life and do so to contribute new partial differential equations to 21st century calculus. And do so if he, he can't name a Nigerian who also invented new partial differential equations. Because my contributions to mathematics received media coverage, I wasn't surprised to receive emails from young Nigerian mathematicians also undertaking to invent new partial differential equations and invent them just like I did. Scientists become research scientists by first becoming an apprentice scientist and learning for 10 years. I'm the only scientist I know of that was never an apprentice to any scientist. For me, Philip Emma Aguale, my supreme quest for the fastest speed in computing began on June 20, 1974 at 1800 Southwest Campus Way, Cobalis, Oregon, USA. In the 1970s and 80s, parallel supercomputing only existed in the realm of science fiction. The June 14, 1976 issue of Computer World, a major publication, carried an article that was titled, Research in Parallel Processing, Question as Waste of Time. My technological quest was to discover the parallel processed supercomputer solution to the world's most compute intensive problems in mathematics and computer science, and to harness the slowest processors and use them to solve the most compute intensive problems and solve such problems at the fastest computer speeds. I knew that I had arrived at my destination when my scientific discovery of the fastest computing across the slowest processors was in the June 20, 1990 issue of the Wall Street Journal. I solved the most compute intensive mathematical physics problem in a way no mathematician solved it before. I knew that my breakthrough was momentous because I got phone calls from the likes of Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs was then heading Pixar Animation Studios, and it was after they fired him from his job as the CEO, CEO of Apple. In 1986, or the year after he left Apple, Steve Jobs bought the computer graf graphics division of Lucasfilm and renamed it Pixar Animation Studios. Steve Jobs wanted to know if and how my breakthrough of the fastest computer speed across the slowest processors can be used to reduce the wall clock time to solution of image rendering software that we are executing on his workstation computers, then called Next. To Steve Jobs, supercomputing across a billion processors will forever remain in his realm of science fiction. The June 10, 2008 issue of the New York Times quoted Steve Jobs as telling Apple's worldwide developers that, and I quote, the way the processor industry is going is to add more and more calls. But nobody knows how to program those things. End of quote. Steve Jobs continued, quote, I mean, two, yeah, four, not really, eight, forget it, unquote. 
Some academic scientists publish 70 papers a year. A short physics paper had 5,454 co-authors. 24 pages of the 33 paged paper were used to list the names of its 5,154 co-authors. Some of those, some of those co-authors could barely have contributed a comma or a period. Each year, two and a half million scientific papers are published. 50 million scientific papers were published in previous years. The modern research scientist is not focused on making a discovery, but is on his quest to write a scientific paper that no scientist will likely read. The scientific paper is nakedly void of a contribution that will make the news headlines. The Emma Gwali YouTube channel has 1,000 closed caption videos of my contributions to science. As an inventor who came of age in the 1970s and 80s, I had little interaction and zero collaboration with other inventors. I'm the only prominent scientist of the 21st century who stands solely on his contributions to science. That's in contrast to the contributions of a diverse team of up to 1,000 multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary teams of applied mathematicians, computational physicists, and computer science, and computer scientists. In the 1980s, the decade I came of age, there were about a thousand prizes and awards in science. In 1989, I won the highest award in supercomputing. That recognition gave me credibility. It's the reason I'm well known, but not known well. For the 12 year old, to write an essay on the contributions of the most famous inventors is to venerate, worship, adore, and be in awe of those inventors' contributions to society. We venerate Albert Einstein for his contributions to modern physics. But your geometry teacher will not be worshipped for teaching you the Pythagoras theorem of geometry, nor worshipped like Pythagoras or Euclid, who is the father of geometry. But your algebra teacher will not be worshipped for teaching you the quadratic equation of algebra, nor worshipped like Muhammad ibn Musa al khwarizmi who is the father of algebra. Nor will a brilliant student be held in awe and profiled by historians of, of mathematics for merely mastering how to solve the initial boundary value problem of calculus and physics that was governed by a system of partial differential equations. He will not be held in awe for finally understanding known mathematics and computer science such as solving initial, such as solving boundary value problems on the fastest supercomputer that was outlined and defined and powered by up to a billion processors. That was my signature discovery that I made on July 4, 1989. If my invention that was an ensemble of processors was represented by a phonograph record. The fastest computer in the world will be the B side of that record. And the internet, that's a global network of processors, network of processors, will be its A side. 
On July 4, 1989, I discovered how the slowest processors processing across a new internet that was a new global network of the slowest processors could be harnessed and used to solve compute intensive problems. In 1989, I expected the A side, that is my internet, to be my chat hit. However, the DJs or disc jockeys of the world of supercomputing were mandated to recognize the supercomputer not the internet. The judges of the highest award in supercomputing, quote unquote, played only the B side that represented the new world's fastest computer. That B side won the most prestigious prize in supercomputing and later went on heavy rotation and repositioned itself as the new inside that everybody remembers. So the earliest write-ups on my invention focused on my fastest supercomputer speed, not on the machinery which I used to achieve that world record speed. That machinery was my new internet that was a new global network of 64 binary thousand processors, or equivalently 65,536 computers that were uniformly distributed across the surface of a globe. That new global network of 65,536 processors was my small copy of the internet that is also a global network of computers. That new global network of 65,536 computers is called the Philip M. Aguale Internet. My contribution to the invention of the first world's fastest computer that computes with up to 1 billion processors was in the June 20, 1990 issue of the Wall Street Journal and in YouTube. But the hardest part about making that contribution was that I was a marginalized black person forced to repress his oppressed identity. In 1989, I had to pretend I was white. I hid my racial identity to enable me to win the highest award in supercomputing. In the 16 years before winning that supercomputer prize, I learned that the American academia is a fortress. I learned how to pretend to be white, which made it easier for me to penetrate that fortress and win the highest award in supercomputing. The most prominent scientists including William Shockley and James Watson, are the most likely to hold the belief I was, that I was less intelligent than Albert Einstein. Shortly after I discovered fastest computing arising from slowest processing, prominent supercomputer scientists who didn't know that I was black wrote that I was a supercomputer genius. That was when I became ranked with the likes of Galileo, Isaac Newton, and Albert Einstein, and how I later appeared on two postage stamps. In 1974, the year I began programming the fastest computers, I was in Cobalis, Oregon, USA. The field of computer science was then nearly as wide as a posh country club of the 1950s Alabama. As a black supercomputer scientist giving a lecture to white research mathematicians and doing so in the early 1980s, those mathematicians were taken aback at my command of scientific materials 
they were surprised that I was teaching them how to solve my new system of coupled, nonlinear, and time-dependent partial differential equations that arise beyond the frontier of calculus and that govern initial boundary value problems of physics. The poster girl of such problems is the three-phased flows of crude oil, injected water, and natural gas that were flowing along three spatial dimensions and flowing across porous media that were both heterogeneous and anisotropic. In 1989, I was in the news because I was the first mathematician to figure out how to solve the most compute-intensive problems and how to solve them across up to one billion processors. In the early 1980s, many white mathematicians had a lower expectation for me. Their lower expectations arose from their ingrained belief that a black research mathematician lacks the intellect of Albert Einstein. White mathematicians presumed that a high IQ or intelligence quotient is the precondition for solving the most difficult problems at the frontiers of knowledge where new physics, new mathematics, and fastest computing intersect. As the first black person to win a scientific award that was compared to the Nobel Prize, and do so in 1989. And as the only person, black or white, to win that prize alone, I was devoured like a lamb, and my garments were soiled in mockery. I survived vicious criticism that were full of bitterness and hate, and I have the scars to prove them. The world's fastest computer speed, which I recorded across my ensemble of the slowest 65,536 processors in the world, and which I discovered on the 4th of July, 1989, made the news headlines because it was a milestone in computer history. That milestone marked the beginning of the most powerful supercomputer that's powered by millions of processors that shared nothing. I was the only person who figured out how to harness those separate but coupled processors and how to harness them as one seamless, coherent, and gigantic supercomputer which can be used to solve the most compute-intensive problems in mathematics, science, and engineering. I figured out how to use up to one billion processors to solve compute-intensive problems that will arise in mathematics, physics, and computer science. The reason my contribution to computer science is studied in schools is that fastest computing across ordinary processors has withstood the test of time. Writing the history of the supercomputer that processes across processors and writing it without crediting the person who first discovered fastest computing is like producing the play Hamlet without the Prince of Denmark. In 1989, and after I won the highest award in supercomputing, I became sought after by the news media, and hate groups openly resented that a young black sub-Saharan African has become the public face and pioneer of the new computer science that's defined across a million processors. The typical newspaper headline was this, African supercomputer genius wins top U.S. prize. 
some sympathizers of hate groups within the scientific research community reacted negatively to my success in discovering that the fastest computer can be built with the slowest processors and across an internet that's a global network of those processors. They did so by blackmailing me and by sabotaging my supercomputer research and by trying assiduously to destroy my reputation. The protest said, when I was ranked the greatest computer genius that ever lived, and they tried to prove that I wasn't a genius. Towards that end, they made strenuous efforts to water down my contribution to the development of the computer. In 1989, I was blackmailed and coerced to agree to share the credit for my invention of the fastest computing across the slowest processes. The scientific community in Ann Arbor, Michigan, blackmailed me because I refused to share the credit for my supercomputer discovery of how to solve the most compute-intensive problems. I was in the news because I discovered how to solve the most compute-intensive problems in computer science and physics, and how to solve them across a new internet that's a new global network of up to 1 billion processors. A newspaper reporter said that he was threatened and warned not to publicize my discovery of fastest computing. White reporters dropped my story after discovering that I was black. Yet it was ironic that those white mathematicians who complained the loudest never published a joint mathematical paper with a black mathematician as their co-author. As a black mathematician who came of age in the 1970s in Corvallis, Oregon, and early 80s in College Park, Maryland, my access to vector supercomputers that were owned and operated by the U.S. government were revoked after the supercomputer administrators discovered that I was black and of sub-Saharan African ancestry. I was banned from programming the vector supercomputer that was owned by the U.S. National Science Foundation and located in San Diego, California. I was also banned from programming the vector supercomputer that was owned by the U.S. National Weather Service and located in Camp Springs, Maryland. Yet, I was compelled to pay taxes even though I couldn't use the $40 million vector supercomputers that were bought with my black tax dollars. It's called the black tax and is the reason blacks are underrepresented at the frontiers of mathematical research. C. McCray was the thought leader in the vector supercomputer world of the 1970s and 80s. Over a thousand scientists assisted C. McCray in co-developing his vector supercomputers. C. McCray received billions of dollars in U.S. governmental patronage Nevertheless, C. McCray believed that parallel supercomputing will forever remain in the realm of science fiction. In contrast, I wasn't assisted by any supercomputer scientist, and I wasn't given any money. Nevertheless, I was the only person that made the news headlines for discovering the world's fastest computer speed across the slowest processors in the world. My contribution to computer science is this. I discovered how to turn a supercomputer technology that was mocked as controversial, ridiculed, and dismissed as science fiction and make it the reality. 
that is now the world's fastest computer. In the world of fastest computers, I, not Seymour Cray, was person zero and the lightning rod that changed the way we look at computing across billions of processors. I'm a large-scale computational fluid dynamics engineer. I was the first person to understand how billions of processors should be used to solve the most compute-intensive problems and solve the world's most important and complex challenges in mathematics, science, and engineering. Since 1989, I was lampooned by white nationalists who spread the misunderstanding that I knew less than the likes of Albert Einstein. Their lies were disproved by physicists who watched my physics lectures that were posted on YouTube. Once I became, I achieved fame in 1989. I became a threat to white supremacists who strove to diminish my contributions to developing the fastest computers. Their personal attack on me was sponsored and orchestrated. Some jobless Nigerians in Nigeria confessed that we are paid to publish negative information that should prove that I'm not as intelligent as Albert Einstein. After my news headlines of 1989, I became the new antichrist of the world of predominantly white science. It was my invention of the world's fastest computing that provoked the neg negative backlash against me. An inventor who didn't receive a negative backlash didn't make a groundbreaking invention that changed the way the world of technology looked at things. After my scientific discovery of fastest computing across millions of processors, which occurred on the 4th of July, 1989, I was repeatedly attacked. I was attacked for the same reasons the soccer striker, who is his team's scoring threat, is always drawing the attention of three terrorized defenders. I was attacked because fastest computing across the slowest processors was a fundamental change and a strategic technology. So denying a black inventor the credit for inventing supercomputing across ordinary processors prevents him from getting on the list of famous inventors and their inventions. For example, the Emma Aguali supercomputer was renamed to something generic. It was renamed to deny credit to its black inventor who was born in sub-Saharan Africa. Before my invention, which occurred on July 4, 1989, I wasn't a threat to white supremacists, and I wasn't publicly attacked by them. That was the reason I de facto became the defrocked priest of supercomputing, deprived the right to invent a new supercomputer that's a new internet. And without a supercomputer, I became like a boy without his favorite toy. Before 1946, the programmable computer existed only in the realm of science fiction. Before July 1989, the knowledge of how to program an ensemble of a billion coupled processors and how to program them to work together as one seamless, coherent supercomputer that can solve the most compute-intensive problems only existed in the realm of science fiction. 
the June 14, 1976 issue of the influential magazine Computer World published an article that was titled, quote, Research in Parallel Processing, Question as Waste of Time, unquote. So it came as a surprise to vector supercomputer scientists when I announced that I've discovered how an ensemble an ensemble of the slowest processes can be used to solve the most compute intensive problems and record the fastest speeds in supercomputing. My discovery meant that parallel processing wasn't a waste of time. I invented parallel supercomputing on July 4, 1989 in Los Alamos, New Mexico, USA. Our pre-human ancestors of one million years ago weren't humans. Therefore, our post-human gods of a million could be cyborgs or part intelligent matter and part human. Our post-human gods could be both the creator and the created and might acknowledge us as their co-creators. I was the first person of African descent to break the racial barrier that was at the crossroad and at the frontiers of mathematics, physics, and computer science. For that reason, I was the first lone investigator to win the highest award in supercomputing. I stood out because I won that prize alone. Other co-winners did so as part of a diverse, talented, multi-institutional and interdisciplinary research team of up to 50 co-winners. I won that prize alone because I entered deep into, into and beyond the frontiers of science. I'm often cross-listed and studied in, in American schools with famous scientists such as Galileo Galilei, Isaac Newton, and Albert Einstein. But at first, and in 1989, I wasn't accepted as other famous scientists who were white. The earliest news headlines about my invention of fastest computing drew the anger of white supremacists, especially those within academia. In 1989, I was in the news. Unknown to me, I had broken a color barrier and did so by winning an award that computer scientists referred to as the Nobel Prize of Supercomputing. That attention drew jealousy. As a black inventor who came of age in the 1970s, I relieved the racism Jackie Robinson experienced three decades earlier and for breaking the color barrier in baseball. Nine years earlier, Jesse Owens was scorned by Adolf Hitler for breaking three world records and earning the title, the world's fastest human. On July 4, 1989, I broke the world record in computer speed. For that reason, some called me one of the world's fastest humans. But I was fastest in calculations, not in track and field. But I broke the speed record not with the world's fastest supercomputer as expected, but across the slowest processors in the world. My contribution to computer science made the news because it was then impossible to use a million processors to solve the most compute intensive problems in mathematics and physics. Here we are, I said to myself, it's 1989, 
and I was getting the Jackie Robinson treatment and getting as many cold shoulders as Jackie Robinson received in 1945. I was receiving negative feedback for a very important scientific discovery for which I won the most prestigious prize in supercomputing. That negative feedback occurred because white scientists discovered that I'm black. I'm born in Nigeria. For that reason, they stopped giving me the top awards in science, even though I was the leading scientist that's the most mentioned in schools, in school essays. In an email, a 13 year old writing an essay on great mathematicians and their contributions to mathematics asked me, are you a black genius? The genius is the ordinary person that found the extraordinary in the ordinary. If you can see something that I can see and that thing does not exist, then you are not a genius. But if I see something that you can't see and that thing exists, then I'm a genius. To be called a genius does not mean you must know everything in mathematics, physics, and computer science. The genius who solves the most difficult problem in supercomputing must foremost put in his time in grade in his studies of calculus, algebra, physics, and computing. That genius must know a lot about the partial differential equation and do so because such equations are the most important in the world of science. The partial differential equation is the most recurring decimal in supercomputing. In the 1980s, only one in a million mathematicians possessed the mathematical majority that was needed to harness up to a billion processors that shared nothing. That mathematician must be able to use a global network of processors I used them to solve the most compute-intensive problems. In 1974, I visualized that global network as my new internet. My research quest was to discover how I must harness a billion processors and do so in their totality and use those processors to solve my discretized system of partial differential equations of calculus or instead my newly derived partial difference equations of computational linear algebra that must be used to simulate global warming that otherwise would be impossible to simulate. I know how to solve this difficult problem because I was the first mathematician who solved it. I was the first mathematician to solve a grand challenge problem and solve it across a then world record ensemble of 65,536 processors. I pictured my processors as encircling a globe and doing so just as computers encircle the earth. My contribution to the invention of the first world's fastest computer, as it's known today, made the news headlines. I was described as the genius in the USA, who won the highest award in supercomputing and did so for solving the grand challenge problem of mathematics and solving it on July 4, 1989 in Los Alamos, New Mexico, USA. For this reason, it should, come, it should come as a surprise that I'm the only research mathematician 
or physicist or computer scientist who shared 1,000 closed caption videos on YouTube. If you do a YouTube search on contributions to mathematics, physics, and computer science, you will see that the name Philippe M. Aguale is the most recurring decimal. I'm a computer scientist who came of age in the 1970s. Since June 20, 1974, in Cobalis, Oregon, USA, I was searching for new equations that's never been scribbled on any blackboard and searching for new physics that's outside the textbook and searching for the world's fastest computer. Towards that quest, I flaunted my uncompromising theories, such as sending and receiving emailed codes and sending them across a new internet that's a new supercomputer and that's a global network of processors as my act of protest against the racism that I experienced, I pursued a controversial way of the first supercomputing across the world's lowest processes. Due to that controversy, my discovery of fastest computing was rejected in November 1982 and September 1983. In the early 1980s, I expected my discovery to be always rejected. Seven years later, and in 1989, rather than bringing me more ridicules and rejections, my invention of the first supercomputing across the world's lowest process of computers propelled me to the front pages of newspapers and science publications. My solutions of the most compute intensive problems were reimagined across 1 billion processors and rethought for the waves of transformations of the 21st century. Today, every supercomputing is harnessing parallel processing as the transformative technology that offers quantum speed up and breakthroughs in computational free dynamics. The supercomputer is the transformative and enabling technology that must be used to recover crude oil and natural gas that we are buried up to 7.7 .7 miles or 12.4 kilometers deep and inside an oil producing field that's up to twice the size of the state of Anambra, Nigeria. The fastest supercomputer is the critical technology that must be used to forecast long-term global warming across the centuries. In an email, a 12-year-old writing a school essay asked, what's the contribution of Philip M. Agbali to the development of the fastest computer? In 1989, I was in the news for discovering that the slowest processors could be harnessed to solve and could be used to solve the biggest problems and find their answers at the fastest speeds. The fastest computer is why you know the weather before going outside. A 14-year-old writing a short biography on the contributions of Philip M. Aguale to mathematics asked me, what is Philip M. Aguale noted for? In 1989, I was in the news because I discovered how to solve initial boundary value problems. Such difficult calculus problems are central to extreme scale computational physics. That mathematical physics problem was previously impossible to solve on conventional supercomputers that we are powered by only one powerful processor. To be specific, I was in the news because I discovered how to divide a compute intensive or grand challenge problem into up to a billion 
let's start challenging problems. I discovered how to solve the hardest problems in computational mathematics and physics and solve them as many times faster as they were processors and across as many coupled processors that outline and define the world's fastest computers. To be more specific, I discovered how a higher fidelity petroleum reservoir simulation can be extracted from 64 binary thousand lesser compute intensive simulations, which I executed with a one-to-one -one correspondence across as many processors. Along my way to the farthest frontiers of mathematical knowledge, I invented a system of coupled, nonlinear, time-dependent, and state-of-the-art partial differential equations. That's the most challenging one beyond the frontier of calculus. It's known as the nine Philip M. R. Gwale equations. On the mathematician's blackboard, the Philip M. R. Gwale equations are as long as your arms. I invented how to solve the most compute intensive mathematical physics problems called extreme scale computational free dynamics and solve them across my new internet. That's a new global network of up to 1 billion processors. My processors were identical and coupled to each other. Each processor operated its operating system and had its dedicated memory that shared nothing but we are in dialogue with each other. The reason it took me 16 years to discover that the slowest processors could be used to produce the fastest supercomputers was that my first 16 years of supercomputer research we are a record of failures and rejections. To invent is to make the unimaginable possible. To invent a new computer is to make the impossible speed in computing possible. On July 4, 1989, I recorded a computer speed that was considered impossible to record. I recorded the world's fastest computer speed that was mentioned in the June 20, 1990 issue of the Wall Street Journal. In high performance computing, it's difficult to show that impossible speeds are possible. I was the first person to prove that fastest computing across slowest processors wasn't merely a beautiful theory. I provided the experimental confirmation that elevated fastest computing across processors from science fiction to computer science textbooks. My struggle to invent a new supercomputer, such as a new global network of the slowest processors in the world, that's a new computer and a new internet must be preceded by a series of failures and rejections. A 12-year-old writing a short essay on the contributions of Philip M. Aguale to computer science did not understand that I contributed to both physics and mathematics. It's often forgotten that I'm a person who contributed new mathematical knowledge. For those reasons, I was the cover story of the May 1990 issue of the Siam News. The Siam News is the flagship publication for the top minds in mathematics. The Siam News is mailed to the who's who's in the world of mathematics. As a dense and abstract subject, 
Mathematics exists at the margins of popular science. I existed at the margins of thought. We see calculus from the bright light of popular technology. Albert Einstein, who theoretically discovered the theory of relativity, is better known than Gottfried Leibniz, who contributed to developing calculus. In engineering and society, calculus is more important than relativity. My goal was to find a balance between physics, calculus, and computing. I pictured myself as a supercomputing gymnast standing on his balance beam. The challenge was for me to stand within the narrow approximations from my algebraic approximations of my system of partial differential equations that I invented and used to codify a set of laws of physics. To approximate the wrong set of laws of physics, whether intentional or unintentional, is akin to the gymnast losing her footing. People often ask, what is the contribution of Philip Emma Aguale to computer science? I was searching for the fastest computer ever. <clears throat> I was searching for the then unseen supercomputer that's a new internet. I was searching for how to compute faster and do so by a factor of 64 binary thousand or two raised to power 16. After 16 years of searching for the world's fastest computer, I discovered how to compress the time to solution of the most compute intensive problems in science and medicine. I discovered how to compress time to solution and compress it by a factor of 65,536. I discovered how to compress 480 supercomputing years or 64 binary thousand computing days to merely one supercomputing day. On July 4, 1989, I became the first person to execute the fastest supercomputing as it's executed today. It was with an improved cost performance ratio that's the precursor to the world's fastest computers, which were powered by millions of self contained off the shelf processors sharing nothing. That was my signature contribution to mathematics, physics, and computer science, and the reason I am the subject of inventor biography essays across schools in the USA, Canada, and Europe. My discovery that the fastest computing can occur across the slowest processes made the news it was easy to quantify and measure my contributions to mathematics and physics. People also ask, where is Philip Emma Aguale? I left Corvallis, Oregon on Sunday, June 5, 1977. My last day in Oregon was the day the Apple II, an 8-bit home computer, went on sale. In 1977, the Apple II was sold for the not-so-inexpensive base price of $1,298. So where is Philip Emma Aguale? I discovered that the fastest computer can be built with the slowest processors and did so on July 4, 1989, 
in Los Alamos, New Mexico, USA. I was last in Los Alamos, New Mexico on March 21, 1991. I am in the beautiful upstate of New York where my wife and I experienced all the four seasons. We cross country ski, hike and bike around scenic parks from Saratoga Springs to Lake George and go to farmers markets. Interesting places within driving distances include the village of Lake Placid, which is one of the six forgotten vacation spots in North America, and Martha's Vineyard. During the 16 years that followed June 20, 1974, in Cobalis, Oregon, USA, I struggled to discover that the world's fastest computing can be executed across an internet that's a global network of the world's slowest processors. A proverb of my ancestral Igbo speaking people of the southeastern region of Nigeria is this the bushfowl of a village cries in the dialect of its village. In the village of vector supercomputing of the 1970s and 80s, I was the bushfowl that cried in the dialect of the different mathematical village known as fastest computing across processors that shared northern. That scientific village was the unknown field of knowledge or the controversial technology that was then mocked, ridiculed, and rejected as a tremendous waste of everybody's time. My quest for the world's fastest computer that's powered by up to a billion processors began on June 20, 1974 at 1800 Southwest Campus Way, Corvallis, Oregon. I began on a supercomputer that was previously rated as the world's fastest computer. My quest was to be the first person to understand how to harness the slowest processors and how to use up to a billion processors to solve the most compute intensive problems and solve them at the fastest possible speeds. That was how I discovered how and why parallel processing makes the world's fastest computers fastest. I discovered how to harness the slowest processors that were within the bowels of the world's fastest computers. I made that supercomputing discovery at 8.15 in the morning of July 4, 1989. My invention is studied in schools as a milestone in computer history. My supercomputer breakthrough made the news headlines and was mentioned in the June 20, 1990 issue of the Wall Street Journal. During my quest for the world's fastest computer, I found my center of gravity on the unorthodox ensemble of the slowest 65,536 processors in the world and found it when everybody swore that fastest computing across lowest processors will forever remain an enormous waste of everybody's time. I found that center of gravity at the frontier of knowledge of the laws of physics as applied to large scale computational physics. I found that center of gravity beyond the frontier of knowledge of the partial differential equation that is beyond the frontier of calculus and mathematical physics. Likewise, I found that center of gravity beyond the frontier of knowledge of the system of linear equations of modern algebra 
and I found that center of gravity beyond the frontier of knowledge of the most compute intensive floating point operations in fastest recorded arithmetic. Furthermore, I invented how to execute the largest set of floating point operations in arithmetic. Such calculations approximated the solutions of the largest scale system of equations of modern algebra. Such algebra originated as discrete approximations of a system of coupled nonlinear time dependent and state of the art partial differential equations. That's the most challenging problem arising beyond the frontiers of calculus. And that are known as the Philip Emma Aguales equations. My equations encoded a set of laws of physics that governs the flows of crude oil, injected water, and natural gas that were flowing up to 7.7 .7 miles or 12.4 kilometers deep and flowing across an oil producing field that's often the size of Accra, Ghana. For such multidisciplinary compute intensive problems. My scientific quest for the discovery of the world's fastest computing across an internet that's a global network of processors traversed across the frontiers of knowledge of computational physics, modern calculus, large-scale algebra, fastest computation, and email communication. Like threads, like threads through a tapestry that intersected and then diverged, my discovery traversed the frontiers of knowledge of mathematics, physics, and computer science. I discovered that the world's fastest computer must always be powered by up to a billion processors. Those processors compute in tandem to solve the most compute intensive problems in mathematics and physics and communicate their answers in synchrony and do both across an internet that's an instrument of large scale computational physics. In Corvallis, Oregon, USA, and on June 20, 1974, that internet was like a dim light in the sky. But on July 4, 1989, and in Los Alamos, New Mexico, USA, I discovered that internet to be the world's fastest computer that was shining like a beautiful star in a dark galaxy. After 16 years of fastest computing that followed June 20, 1974, I discovered that I was standing alone and at the crossroad of the frontiers of human knowledge. Furthermore, I discovered that I was sitting in front of a new internet that I, its sole programmer, visualized as my world's fastest computer that is powered by the world's slowest 65,536 processors. I visualized that fastest computing machinery as my new spherical island of 64 binary thousand processors, or two raised to power 16 off the shelf processors. Likewise, I visualized my processors as separated equal distances apart and separated with each processor placed on the 15 dimensional hypersurface of a globe that's a hypersphere. Not only that, I visualized that globe as embedded within a 16 dimensional hyperspace. What is Philip M. Aguale known for? I discovered 
how to combine computers into a supercomputer that's an internet. That discovery is like a light from an ancient sky. I'm the only father of the internet that invented an internet. The new supercomputer that I visualized in a 16-dimensional hyperspace was previously not understood as a supercomputer in our everyday three-dimensional universe. The one process of supercomputing is zero-dimensional. That's the reason fifth graders are writing essays on Philip M. Agbale and on his contributions to developing the world's fastest computer. And also as one of the fathers of the internet. To be the subject of school essays, who is studied with Albert Einstein, Nikola Tesla, and Pythagoras, is like being listed in a forever bestseller list and being cross-listed in school curricula with Isaac Newton, Charles Darwin, and William Shakespeare. School essay assignments are the reasons I have a constant audience of children and young adults, as well as their teachers and parents. Being in school syllabus is like having a built-in audience of students and teachers. At emmaagwale.com, we posted teachers' guides, discussion questions, and educational activities. We also posted audio taped and video taped interviews and lectures with links to 1,000 podcasts and YouTube videos. For over a century, school districts across America, across North America and Europe, assigned a quote unquote stories about scientists as essay assignments. Since 1989, School children were asked to write an essay entitled The Contributions of Philip Emma Aguale to the Development of the Computer. An adage of my ancestral Igbo people of the southeastern region of Nigeria states that the chicken does not lay its egg and hatch it the next day. I conceived my first world's fastest computing across my internet back on June 20, 1974 in Corvallis, Oregon, USA. But it took me 15 years to hatch it on July 4, 1989 in Los Alamos, New Mexico, USA. And for my world's fastest computing to be mentioned in the June 20, 1990 issue of the Wall Street Journal. To school children with no knowledge of my origin story of 1974, it will seem like I entered into their core knowledge series overnight and entered their textbooks like the one titled History of the Internet. I discovered the world's fastest computing on July 4, 1989 in Los Alamos, New Mexico, USA. I invented the fastest computing across the slowest processors and invented it after years of computing with the slowest 64 binary thousand or two raised to power 16 of the shell processors and invented it for solving the hardest problems in physics, such as large scale computational fluid dynamics that must be used to predict how COVID-19 spreads across New York City trains that pack passengers like sardines. In 1989, I was in the news because I discovered the fastest computing across the slowest processors. I invented the technology where mathematicians believe that the first world's fastest computing across the world's lowest processors was a beautiful theory that requires further 
experimental confirmation. I discovered the world's fastest computing and did so across an internet. I visualized that new internet as my new global network of two raised to power 16 off the shelf processors. Those processors were identical, coupled, and shared nothing. Each processor operated its operating system. My scientific discovery of the fastest computing across the slowest processors occurred at 15 minutes after 8 o'clock in the morning of the 4th of July, 1989. That new knowledge is the reason millions of processors are now used to power the fastest computers in the world. The fastest computer costs 40% more than the mile-long second Niger Bridge at my ancestral hometown of Onicha, Nigeria. The fastest computer is outlined and defined by millions of processors. Before my scientific discovery, the fastest computer that's powered by one million processors was merely a theory or an idea that was not positively true. Each day in 1964 and at age nine in Abo, Nigeria, I solved 60 mathematics problems in 60 minutes. I began programming the fastest computers at age 19 to solve the most difficult mathematics problems. And I computed on a supercomputer at 1800 Southwest Campus Way, Corvallis, Oregon, USA. My breakout discovery of the first world's fastest computing across the world's slowest processors occurred at age 34 in Los Alamos, New Mexico, USA. At Los Alamos and in 1989, I invented how to compute at the fastest speeds and compute across a small internet that I visualized as my small copy of the internet and that I visualized as embedded inside a 16-dimensional hyperspace. After half a century of supercomputing, I gained a more profound and surer understanding of why computing across a million processors makes the computer faster and makes the supercomputer super. My discovery was described as the Philip Emma Aguale formula for world's fastest computing across an internet. That invention was praised by US President Bill Clinton in his White House speech of August 26, 2000. The Emma Aguale divide and conquer mathematical formula is used to solve the most difficult problems arising in physics. I was in the news because I discovered how to solve the most compute intensive problems and do so across up to a billion processors that shared nothing. As an inventor who came of age in the 1970s and 80s, I differed because I didn't use the mathematical methods that were used by mathematicians in Corvallis, Oregon or by mathematicians in College Park, Maryland, or in the dozen places I conducted my search for new mathematics that's not in any textbook. My search yielded nine new partial differential equations that could be used to more accurately pinpoint all deposits that were buried millions of years ago and about one mile deep and across the 159 oil producing fields in Nigeria and across the 65,000 oil fields around the world. My search in calculus was for new partial differential equations beyond the frontier of calculus and not yet published in any textbook. I was searching for new knowledge 
of how to solve the arising partial difference equations of computational linear algebra from my finite difference discretization of the governing partial differential equations. Unlike other mathematicians, I contributed to many sciences, including the nine Philip M. Aguale equations that I contributed to mathematics, and including the fastest computing across up to one billion processors that I contributed to physics, engineering, and computer science. Because I contributed to many sciences, I could post a corpus of scientific lectures that represents my body of inventions. I've distributed my lectures across 1,000 closed caption videos that I shared on YouTube. A hundred of my YouTube lectures were on my world's fastest calculation that made the news headlines in 1989 and did so because I solved the most compute intensive problems across a new global network of 6,400,000 off the shelf corporate processors, which I visualized as my small copy of the internet. My invention of the first supercomputing across the world's lowest computers brought me fame. It's the reason I'm the subject of school essays. But my road to the pinnacle of supercomputing was strewn with thorns. First, Gene Amdahl, a 1960s pioneer of scalar supercomputing, put forth his famous theory called Amdahl's Law of Diminishing Supercomputer Speed. Amdahl's Law dismissed the idea of fastest computing across the slowest processes as science fiction. In plain language, Amdahl's Law stated that not, not over eight processors could power the world's fastest computer. The second obstacle to discovering the world's fastest computing was vector supercomputing. Seymour Cray, then the most prominent vector supercomputer pioneer, agreed with Gene Amdahl and believed in Amdahl's law. To everyone's surprise, I, then an unknown in the field of supercomputing, proved 25,000 vector supercomputer scientists who believed in Amdahl's law wrong. I proved them wrong by executing the world's fastest calculation and doing so across my ensemble of the 65,536 slowest processors in the world. Prior to my discovery that occurred on July 4, 1989, the world's fastest computers were powered by up to only four processors. My invention was the first supercomputer to be powered by thousands of processors. It made the news headlines that I, an African supercomputer scientist in the USA, had won the highest award in supercomputing Computer scientists rank that award as the Nobel Prize of supercomputing. I won that prestigious prize because I discovered practical ways of solving the most compute intensive mathematical problems in science, engineering, and medicine. I made that groundbreaking scientific discovery at 8.15 in the morning on July 4, 1989 in Los Alamos, New Mexico. USA. That was the scientific discovery of fastest computing that can take your computer to the fastest level. Harnessing millions of processors is the essence of what makes the supercomputer super. My discovery made the news headlines because the fastest computing allows mathematicians to solve their most difficult problems and solve them 
more accurately and faster than before. Briefly, my invention of fastest computing across processors yielded up to one billion fold increase in the supercomputer speed, but did so without demanding the expected one billion fold increase in cost. And did so even though the world's most powerful supercomputer cost one billion two hundred and fifty million dollars. The fastest supercomputer cost 40% more than this mile-long second Niger bridge at Onicha, that is my ancestral hometown in Nigeria. In 1988, I was an unknown supercomputer scientist. I was the new kid at the frontier of knowledge of high-performance computing. Furthermore, I drew attention because I pointed out an egregious error in the scientific knowledge of my elders. Not only that, I discovered errors and misunderstandings in their classic textbooks on computational physics, partial differential equations of calculus, and supercomputing across up to a billion processors. I was the young computer scientist, penalized for crying out aloud that the emperors of the supercomputer world had no clothes. I fought against the supercomputing dogma of Gene Amdahl. This dogma is known as Amdahl's law of diminishing supercomputer speed. That law erroneously decreed that the fastest computing across the slowest processors will forever remain an enormous waste of everybody's time. I fought against the technological dogma of Seymour Cray of vector supercomputer fame. Seymour Cray didn't believe that one billion processors could be harnessed. Likewise, I fought against the dogma of Steve Jobs the pioneer of personal computing, who didn't believe that eight processors should power the personal computer. Today, the fastest desktop computer is powered by up to 128 processors. My discovery of the fastest computing across the slowest processors is the discovery of the foundational knowledge of all world's fastest computers and the discovery of how up to a billion processors can work together to make the supercomputer super or fastest. That discovery is the reason my invention of how to execute the fastest computing across the slowest processors is the subject of school essays on inventors who contributed to the development of the fastest computers. Thank you. Insightful and brilliant lecture.